It's called I Dream a World. Did I mention he was African American? Yeah. White American? And Native American. His ethnicity was all over the place. <laughs> I dream a world where man no other will scorn, where love will bless the earth and peace its path adorn. I dream a world where all will know sweet freedom's way, where greed no longer saps the soul, nor avarice blights our way. I dream a world where black or white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of the earth, and every man is free. Where wretchedness will hang its head, and joy, like a pearl, attends the needs of all mankind. Of such a dream, our world. Thanks for you. Let's stand for the white. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have the adoption of the agenda as recommended by the superintendent. However, I have one item to add to the agenda. And I'll discuss it when we get down to the food and consent agenda. It's a very generous donation to our school system, and we're particularly moved. These are coming in small, large, uh, and the people are just saying, we support you, we care about you, we want to uh, give some money to the children. So. I'll make a motion that we adopt the agenda as recommended by the superintendent with the new item added to the consent agenda for the donation. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Dodd, seconded by Mr. Kenton to adopt the agenda as recommended by the superintendent with the new item added with the donation. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries. 4-0. Thank you. Next we have the uh, approval. No, no. Sorry. We have citizens' comments. Now I have uh, Mr. Lloyd. Would it be okay if you came up now? Yeah. Oh, because I, I had it here. I got it. The sooner I get up, the sooner I go. Oh. <laughs> so that works for me. Okay. Okay, so earlier this afternoon I went to four with county commissioners. They actually for once did something which I liked. <laughs> it was rare. But they passed an ordinance, or it's actually a major revision to an existing ordinance, which amongst other things will make it illegal for people to chain their dogs up in their yards and leave them there until they starve and will die. Yeah. Which, as you would gather from the tone of my voice, is something I feel very strongly about. Um, I mean, just to me, that is beyond disgusting. So, that was good. Passed by zero. My purpose in coming to see you folks this afternoon, you know, this is the first opportunity I've had since the end of August, and the end of August, of course, was election time. And uh, you know the way it goes, you win a few, and you lose a few. Yeah? Unfortunately, one of the ones that we lost was the half cent sales tax, which was one of those which I would like to have won yeah. for a whole variety of reasons. So I thought I'd come along this afternoon and just say thank you to literally everybody, and it includes most of the people in this room. Yeah? You know, who did something to try and turn the vote out. Frankly, and, and Doug Dodd and I were just talking a few minutes ago, we expected it to be much, much closer. But you never know with elections, they're funny things. But I think everybody from Sam downwards, you know, did something, got out a mailer, phoned a few people, etc., etc. And right up until the end, you know, the word out in the street was, well, you know, we've got some heavy hitters behind us now. It may fly. So, you know, I'm sorry we didn't come, but we certainly tried. And I learned quite a bit from it in terms of, uh, you know, if I were doing this again, I'd do it very differently. Yeah? One doesn't have that 
pleasure of being able to turn the clock back. So, thank you for all the work you put in, and let's, oh, and one, yeah, one closing. Don't let's give up, yeah? Let's find a way to extricate the funds that you genuinely need, yeah? And, you know, find a way to get it out of the county commission or the state government or whatever it is. Thank you. With that, I'm leaving. No, thank you, Mr. Wood. Thanks for all your help, too, and your support. Okay. Uh, next, the consent agenda approval. Would someone like to move to approve the consent agenda? Mr. Fruit? Second. It's been moved by Ms. Fry, seconded by Mr. Kennedy to approve the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries 4 0. Linda, would you read? Uh, do you have papers that I just passed out? Okay. Would you read that and then the rest of the consent agenda? We have several donations, as Mrs. Power has referenced to on this consent agenda for today. The first one is a $50,000 anonymous donation to Wicklacoochee Technical College, a $1,500 donation to Chris River High School from Natalie's Restaurant, a $1,000 donation to Chris River High School from Dr. and Mrs. Sisto, a Chris River High School received a donation value of approximately $3,200 for the refurbishment of a Bramlett Stadium sign from Eagle Buick, the thousand dollar donation to Citrus High School from J.M. Gibson Mechanical Inc., a fifteen hundred dollar donation to Citrus High School from Scott L. Lee, a thousand dollar donation to Lacanto High School from Golf to Lake Sales, a fifteen hundred dollar donation to Chris River Middle School from Daisy E. Price, a five hundred dollar donation to Citrus Springs School from Tora and Beth Carmen, a seven hundred two dollar donation to Lacanto Primary School from donor choose.org, a $3,497 grant donation to Lakanto Primary School from Gen U Foundation, a $1,000 donation to Fuller City Elementary School from Iberia Bank, a $500 donation to Hernando Elementary School from Cattle Dog Coffee Roasters, a $1,000 donation to Homosassa Elementary School from Homosassa Game and Fish Club, a $2,500 donation to Wicklacoochee Technical College from the United Way. Great. If those are people who are saying to us through those donations, we really believe in education. We really support you and, and thank you for doing what you're doing. So we're thrilled to have that. Thanks so much, Linda. Next we have Ms. Mason. We are honored to be here this evening. Um, we are so excited for the opportunity to recognize this elite um, group of young people as well as Colonel Yambros. Um, our group was recognized as um, a group among only 8%, the top 8% um, in the nation to receive the Distinguished, Distinguished Unit with Merit Award by the Air Force Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps. So we are very um, excited. You're going to hear a little bit more from Cadet um, Cook. And I'm going to turn it over now to Cor Colonel Yamros. But we have uh, some exciting things to share about our program. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mason. Ms. Simmel, uh, members of the board. Colonel Dennis Yamros, a senior aerospace science instructor at Citrus High School for FL082, uh, Air Force Junior ROTC. And we'd like to uh, tell all of you uh, about what went into uh, receiving the Distinguished Unit Award with, with Merit and some of our goals for the future. I'd like to introduce my cadet staff, our cadet group commander, Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Lexis Cook, our cadet operations support squadron commander, Cadet Major Austin Miller, and our command chief, the senior enlisted person in our junior ROTC program, Cadet Chief Mass Sergeant Morgan Plank. <clears throat> this is our, our leadership team for uh, the upcoming semester, and uh, already I think we've accomplished four or five different community service events, and uh, they're running, uh, running wild. So I'm going to introduce Cadet Lieutenant Colonel Cook to come up and uh, have her just tell you a little bit about what went into our program over the last couple of years. Ms. Cook. I'm sorry. 
sorry. All right, if you look to the screen, you'll see just the introduction of our unit. Our senior aerospace instructor, as you just met him, is Colonel Dennis Ambrose. Our air for, er, aeros science instructor is Chief Master uh, Tammy Leopard, who is unable to attend tonight. I am the group commander of the first semester of Air Force Junior ROTC Unit FL082, and the second group commander has yet to be announced as they are currently reserved and awaiting their active enlistment into our unit. This is a brief overview of everything we'll be going over in the slideshow today, from unit goals all the way down to our semester field trip. Our unit goals for 2016-2017. We tend to keep the um, general goals the same per year. The cadet corps will maintain an average cumulative GPA of 3.0 or greater, and we will accumulate an average of 12 community service hours per cadet. Community service hours for our unit are imperative. We mandate every cadet put forth their effort in, in his or her community and show that we truly represent our school and everyone within Citrus County. Our school impact goals include a car guard who we provided for every requested event in the school system. We have kept up to this for many, many years and we plan to continue it for as long as we can. The cadet corps will attend a recruiting day at local middle school and actively recruit new cadets. This we allow our senior command staff to do as we want to represent the best to our upcoming freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. We want to continue the program as best we can. Community service impact goals. The school will attain a personal record for the donation count of blood drives this year, which is 359. <coughs> I headed up the White South Blood Drives at Citrus High School myself last year. It has been turned over to Cadet Matthew Brunson this year, and I hope we for good results. The Cadet Corps also accomplished a 10% more community service events than last year. We, again, mandate that we have a great presence in this community to represent all that we are for. Wellness Fitness Program. Every unit in Air Force Junior ROTC is mandated to complete a PFE, Presidential Fitness Assessment, PFA, my bad. Um, events accomplished are push-ups, sit-ups, B-sit, reach, shuttle run, and the one-mile walk-slash-endurance event along with several sports on the Fridays in between our preliminary test and our end of the year exam. Good accomplishments. We did receive distinguished unit for the 2014-2015 school year, as well as an exceeding standards rating on the April 6, 2016 Headquarters Air Force Junior ROTC conducted unit evaluation. Distinguished unit with merit was granted for the 2015-2016 school year, mandating that we are the top 8% of all Air Force Junior RTC units in the world. Cadets averaged a 2.91 unweighted and 3.019 weighted GPA. Three cadets were inducted into the National Honor Society of Citrus High School, with two, including myself, um, upcoming nomination for the United States Air Force Academy. Cadets ISS and OSS school um, and bus suspension rating significantly lower than the rest of the school population. We made the best behavior of our cadets to represent this uniform, to represent Air Force Junior ROTC, and our school and community as well. 91% of Air Force Junior ROTC graduating seniors had a solid career plan. They left Citrus High School knowing what they were doing, and many I'm pleased to say I still keep in contact with are serving our country at this moment. Citrus Air Force Junior ROTC has presented in the 2016 field competition against Chris Server in Lacanto High School's ROTC uh, units as well. This is a yearly event, and we proudly place either first or second every year that we have competed. And up you'll see just pictures of our cadets in action, essentially. Color Guard for Veterans Day Parade, presentation of colors, and the many community service events and competitions that we partake of. When did you go to the race game? Yeah, that's fine. That is that is every year, sir. Our color guard is specifically requested for the race game. So we get the best cadets we have performing and we take them up there and they perform for the race game. Every game. Every year. Well, the first game. <coughs> every year. The, the first game of the year. I apologize. <laughs> Drill team. Drill team is mandated that every cadet upon drill team knows how to command the 30 command sequence. That is a chain of commands of a flight of nine or greater that every cadet must learn to lead. Voice projection, knowing their their commands, which foot to call on, etc. They are competing in a competition in two Saturdays, I believe, is upcoming. And next you'll see our color guard. Our color guard carries the colors for every football game, 
every event that we are requested of, we make sure we have provided one for our community whenever it is needed. Are y'all gonna be involved in Veterans Day? Yes, ma'am. Sabre Team, close to my own heart, I was the non-commissioned officer in charge of Sabre Team last year. Sabre Team tries to keep the traditional aspects of the Air Force um, ROTC program alive. We have a very small Sabre Team at the moment, we're hoping to grow. We attend a variety of recruiting events, such as the local middle school recruiting day, presentation of colors at the local middle school events to demonstrate a positive example of an Air Force ROTC unit, as well as ninth grade orientation. We host a booth for ninth grade orientation every year to promote awareness of our unit. As I'm sure all of you know, ROTC is not exactly the first thing students think of when entering high school. It is something that you just happen to see on your schedule. We make sure that we are known throughout our school. We have a very high presence within our halls. We, we are known by our uniform. And we make sure to stay very good known as well. Community service. We're very proud to announce that we met and exceeded our unit goal of 12 community service hours per cadet last year, coming in at 14.14 hours per cadet. Our major events include Friends of the Library, Highway Cleanups, Parking, Band Competition, which is an 18-hour day for those who are there from start to finish, Blood Drives, and the Presentation of Colors at all requested events. Our CIA trip. Every semester, we mandate a unit field trip open to every cadet who meets the criteria of a 3.0 GPA or higher, no ISS or OSS on their record, and good moral standing in our unit, including uniform wear every Wednesday. Last year, we attended the Armed Forces History Museum in Largo, Florida, and coming up in November, we are planning a Jacksonville Naval Air Base field trip for three days and two nights to our top cadet to meet our criteria. Our overall accomplishments that I'd like to highlight today. Again, distinguishing unit with Mayor for 2015-2016, we are the top 8% of all Air Force Junior ROTC units worldwide, and we claim that proudly. The headquarters Air Force Junior ROTC assigned tasks accomplished on or before suspense dates. We meet everything given to us head on, and we do so with our heads high and with speed to our step. Cadets met or exceeded unit established goals, community service being the first and foremost. Cadets and instructors received and exceed standards rating on the headquarters Air Force Junior RTC conducted in the evaluation. That was the evaluation of Colonel Yamos and Chief Master Sergeant Leopard. They exceed any wishes that these cadets could have for our instructors, and they're the greatest possible role models that we could ask for to guide us in our own wishes of a military career post high school. Thank you. The 14.14 um, hours equates to about 1,711 hours last school year of community service by this group of young people, so that's pretty um, outstanding. At this time, we would like to recognize you. I don't think I'm high enough in the ranks to actually award this, so we're going to recognize you um, at this time for being, once again, uh, the Distinguished Unit with Merit. Great representation for Citrus High School. We're very proud of all that you do. Thank you. I see Mr. Hilger here too. It'd be nice for him to come up, I think. Yeah.
want to say too, um, as uh, to the cadets and yourselves, that uh, I, I'm, I, I won't speak for all the board, but I think, I'm pretty sure that they have similar feelings. We have such great support for the JORTC programs in our high schools, and we are very grateful for the work you're doing as you continued your service in a different way. Um, we, we recognize, you know, a lot of people have a misunderstanding sometimes about the JORTC program. It's not really, while a lot of I know of the cadets will go into service, it's not a recruiting tool. In fact, I think Colonel would probably say it's one of the rules typically is this is a leadership program. And uh, you can see by the elite uh, students in front of us, uh, this is, to me, is, as much as a interne uh, international baccalaureate program or any high-end academy um, is our JORTC candidates um, and young people. We, uh, we go to board members. Uh, we get to train with them and, and go around the state. And recently, I had a board member from another county say, man, how are you keeping your JORTC programs going? We can't keep ours filled. I said, our problem is, we're growing so big, some of them, that uh, we're, we're troubling trying to keep them from expanding more. We, and we're not trying to keep you from it, but we're, we're busting at the seams, generally. That's a good problem for us to have. And uh, I'm grateful for your service, Colonel. Young people, you are just amazing. You truly are. And uh, so I just wanted to share that, board members. And you know, we know that our school system is in the top 10%, if that's the 5% of the state, and they're keeping top 8% of the world? Yes. That's not bad. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. We're proud of you guys. Next we have school support services and display. I may need to get PowerPoint presentation tips from her. She did a phenomenal <laughs> job. <laughs> she did a great job. Phenomenal. And she didn't read every slide. No, she did not. <laughs> yes, ma'am. That's what I was thinking. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> I would like to request um, approval of the instructional and support recommendations as listed on the golden rod. Second. It's been moved by uh, Ms. Bryant, uh, seconded by Mr. Kennedy to approve the uh, personnel information instruction and support on the Golden Rock. I have a question. Yes. In reference to the Christopher Mill School gender, gender equity volleyball, I'm, I'm not sure at, at what are we, um, I haven't seen it as that before at the middle school. That position, gender equity volleyball. Yes, Mr. Bishop. In an uh, effort to maintain gender equity, many years ago the school uh, school district uh, implemented gender equity supplements for sports, female sports that uh, have such a large turnout that they need extra coaches to ensure proper supervision and uh, instruction. In this case here, their numbers must have eclipsed the uh, threshold, and to be quite honest with you, I haven't been in that world in a uh, quite a few years, but um, Mr. Sheffield has the athletic handbook and there's actually a set number that if the uh, number of participants eclipses that uh, threshold, they can apply it for a gender equity supplement. I believe the last time I checked, there's six available for all of the district to apply for should the need be there. Okay, thank you very much. And exciting, uh, we have a second generation educator uh, there, it looks like who's gonna end up being a coach, so. Well done, Citrus County. <clears throat> Any other comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Those carries 4 0. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Now we have um, Ms. Shirt, sorry, excuse me, risk management. Well, that was a very, this is a very odd, pleasing, attractive presentation that you have here. You can read it, it's not glaring, it's very clear. Good afternoon. 
I am here to seek approval for 2017 health insurance renewal. If, before I begin or before we do that, I'd like to share some information with you and some options that we have considered before coming to you with a recommendation. I'd like to also thank Brian Branham for being here. He's with Crown and he's our third party administrator for our health insurance and we appreciate him helping us through every step of this process. He's been a big help and contributed quite a bit to our process. Mr. Baumer is also going to assist in this presentation. And you've made me a little self-conscious. I'm going to try real hard not to read PowerPoint slides. <laughs> I don't know how successful I'll be. I just want to recap. As you know, we've been coming to you on a quarterly basis and updating you on what's happening in the health insurance world. And um, you are aware of the things that have been happening, the increases, increases that are occurring. And I just want to reflect a little bit on what we've discussed. The increase in cost in our medical services that we know are on the rise and have been increasing. We've been facing that in 2015 and 2016. The increase in pharmacy expenses. You know, we've done things to try to help mitigate that and offset that along the way with our mail order pharmacy that we've been able to do. We've also had several extremely high claimants. And our group is large enough that we can be self-insured but yet we're small enough that when there is a handful of claimants who have extremely high claims, we do feel that. And we have experienced a significant amount of that in 2015 and 2016, and that's contributing to where we are today. Also, the Affordable Care Act, the fees that we're mandated to pay and the plan that we're mandated to offer to our employees. And the number of folks that we have had that have migrated to this Affordable Care Act plan which is um, drastically affecting the revenue that we have in our account to pay our, our claims. Sherry, would you just take a second and explain that uh, to people who are listening about the fees involved, because most don't know about that, uh, and anything else about the affordable care. There is an annual fee that we are mandated to pay to the government for because of the Affordable Care Act, and then there is we are mandated to offer a plan that is affordable to our employees. And what we have to do according to the statute or according to the mandate is we have to look at our lowest paid employees that work 30 hours in our district. And, we, and the fees that they pay for their health, and health insurance cannot surpass more than 9.5% of what their income is. Because of that, it's a very low premium for this plan that we must offer. We're, it is an extremely high deductible, but um, it is a cost it is hurting us with our revenue because of the low fee that we have to offer for folks to have this plan. And we don't just offer this plan to the folks who meet that category, it has to be offered to all employees. So you might, or someone may think that this 30 hour lowest employee that qualifies for this plan, but the fact that we offer it, it's offered to all employees. So many employees migrated to this plan with this very low premium, and that has had a significant impact on the revenue that we have. So you'll see as we go over these plans that we're offering, you'll see some things we're doing to try to offset or mitigate that to help us in our revenue. And again, why do we have a fee that we have to pay? That's the it's funny just part of the, It's just change? part of part the Affordable of Care Act that we I are know, mandated. But, but it, so you're saying that the federal government yes. says that fee? Yes. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. And then as you know, the actuarial requirements that we have that we need to meet to be actuarially sound on an annual basis. And those things and the interpretations of what we need to be actuarially sound have um, varied and become more stringent for us. So we've gone through the 2017 renewal process thus far. We're continuing in this process. The steps that we have taken we have a committee, and that consisted of Mr. Bishop, myself, Mr. Baumer, and we met with um, Brian from Crown. And we met numerous times. I would say we met six to eight times. One evening we were here in the conference room upstairs until midnight meeting. So we had numerous meetings, and we looked at many factors to try to, to decide what is the best way we can approach this um, and hurt our employees the least that we possibly can. So we looked at the data, we looked at our claims history, we looked at our 2015 claims, our 2016 claims, we looked at our expenses, we looked at the fixed expenses, and we looked at the variable expenses. 
and um, we spent a lot of time analyzing those and thinking what can we do um, to try to go through this renewal process. We reviewed the cost increases that would be involved in any plan changes. And we're going to share with you today all of the plans that we looked at, and then we'll share with you what the committee's recommendation and what our recommendation is to the board. But you're going to see that we looked at everything we could think of. We looked at the fully insured. We looked at um, four other options as well. And we will, um, Steve's going to go into a little bit more detail about that in just a moment. We reviewed the number of members that were effect, affected by the plan changes. So you're going to see that in a couple of our options, where we did a straight across the board increase for our employees, and then we looked at it and said, well, how can we shift this and look at, and we looked at how many people were on which plan and, and tried to shift those um, increases to benefit the most. We also reviewed these plan options, of course, with our executive team, and then we brought the options to the Health Insurance Committee. And we very much value what we hear from our Health Insurance Committee. And I'd like to thank Mrs. Ryan for her continued support and her membership and input on that committee. As you know, we have um, a representative from all departments and all sites on this Health Insurance Committee now. So we did um, talk to them, we showed them all of the plans, they were pretty quick to be able to eliminate a couple of the options, then we were left with two that bubbled up to the top. One thing, and then last, of course, is we are here today to share information with you, to seek your input, and to seek approval so that we can move forward with our open enrollment. But I'd like to mention that um, just to, and this is something we reminded our health insurance committee of as well, that we have experienced six pretty good years as far as health insurance renewals. This is a more difficult year than we are accustomed to in our renewal process. <coughs> a difficult year that we're having. Surrounding districts have had numerous difficult years in the past six years. So I do just want to re um, remind folks that we've had some very, very good years. And although people are going to forget that and that's not going to matter, we do know this is a difficult year. And that's why we've been working long and hard to try to um, do the best we can to come up with options for this renewal. And I also want to mention that this is a multi-year plan that we have. We are, um, these plans, each of these plans that are going to be presented to you are building our reserves by a million. And this is a step towards becoming and working towards being actuarially sound. So I wanted to um, mention that, that it is a multi-year plan. The committee, they were fairly quick to um, eliminate fully insured. I'm just going to kind of cap for you what the committee's thoughts were as we're going into this, and then we're going to present these plans to you. But they were pretty quick to um, discount the fully insured, and Steve will go into more detail as to why, but one glaring thing is if we were to go fully insured, we would not have, have the benefit of the Wellness Center. And that was a huge factor for their consideration, and they were quite, quite quick to eliminate that as an option. So we were left with options one, two, three, and four. And after sharing these plans with them, they fairly quickly were able to um, eliminate options one and three, which left us with two and four. And they were pretty well split on two and four. I believe there were 13 that said option two, and there were 15 that said, I, I might have that backwards, I think they had 15 who said option two, and 13 that said option four. But they were pretty well split. And since they were so split, we said to them, is there anyone in here who can't live with option two or four? So we did leave that meeting um, knowing that the committee is suggesting options two or four. And then as we looked at it harder, and we thought of the implications, what if we went with two? What would that do to our plan as a whole? What if we go with four? What will that do to our plan as a whole? And our recommendation to you today will be to go with um, option four. So I, wanted, I want you to know that and have that in the back of your mind as we go into the um, explanations of the different plans. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Steve, and he is going to walk you through the various plans. Good afternoon. Uh, I get the fun job of going over the, the financial impact that this is going to have on our members. Um, as you can see, we have three plans. Uh, as Ms. Sarnish brought up, the glaring difference between fully insured and our other four plans is that this does not include the wellness center. So whenever you look at the increase per pay period, there's some other factors we need to include in that. At the wellness center uh, this last year, we had 7,800 patient visits. That was not included in the factoring of the premiums. We had over 14,000 prescriptions filled at the Wellness Center through the last year and through the mail order. That is not included in this. 
and the fully insured option here, the insurance company takes 10 months and they give you a claim based on that. So if we were to do this the next year, they would be looking at 12 full months of claims and all of the doctor's visits and the prescriptions that were done at the wellness center would be back on the plan. So that amount that we'd be looking at for the next year of renewal would be much, much greater. Once that was explained to the committee, they understood very well that that was not something that we wanted to do. But we did want to present the information to you so you could see exactly what the pay increase, uh, cost would be per pay period. Now, the next four options are going to be labeled options one, two, three, and four. Um, option one keeps the plan very similar to what we have now, but there's a $1,000 increase um, out of pocket for each plan. It distributes it uh, the cost evenly across all the plans. If you look to the far right, this is a, a per pay period increase. This does not include any sort of change as far as the board match would, would be included. If you look down at the uh, 5172 option at the Can bottom. Just state that again, I'm sorry. Yeah, this, is, this does not include any sort of increase in board match. This is taking the information we have now, and this is how much, if the board match stayed the same, how much more they would be paid. At the bottom of 5172. No, no increase. Okay. No increase. The exact same board match. Yes, ma'am. At the bottom, 5172. There's not an amount written in there, and I'm going to explain that to you. As Ms. Cernich said, as far as the Affordable Care Act goes, we have to look at the amount that it, we pay our lowest paid 30 hour employee. The Affordable Care Act says that their health care premium cannot exceed, the amount they pay cannot exceed 9.5% of their pay. If we do increase the board match, that would change that premium. But if you look to the far right, at no point will their out-of-pocket increase by more than $21.91. That would take them to the maximum that they are allowed to pay. Part of the reason for that is what they're paying currently at this point, they are not actually even meeting the necessary requirements we have for the fees that we have to pay for, for our insurance. So this would help, they would be including um, an increase that would help offset the cost of their insurance. Now, option two, this is one of them Ms. Ernst talked about that the committee felt comfortable with. This one had a $2,000 increase out of pocket. Again, on the far right hand side shows the different costs that it would be increased per pay period for each member, depending on what plan they have. And as with the other option, it does not show any sort of increase in board match. This is the board match as it stands right now. And again, at the bottom, 5172 would go up the exact same amount to the maximum allowed by the ACA. Okay. Now, option three. In option three, we have a $2,000 board match, and this would be the removal of employee plus one. There was no options taken off the table whenever we were having a discussion. What can we do to try to reduce the cost to our members? One of the options we even talked about was what if we did away with one of our plans, how much would that save us? And that was a negligible amount, seven tenths of 1%. What is it, was it worth us doing that to our members? So if we took out employee plus one and had a $2,000 increase out of pocket, the pay per, the increase per pay period is listed on the right. Now option four is the one that um, I believe that we would be recommending to the board. Um, this one spreads out the increase. It will also help us with what we've been dealing with with the plan migration, the 258 members who left our plans and went down to the 5172. And we lost a ton of revenue and we were exposed more on fees. By this plan, we imagine many of them would move up to 5168 where there's a, a smaller increase, but also help increase, increase our revenues and hopefully get more of our members to, uh, to be visiting the wellness center. Why did you say they would move up? Because uh, there would be a less of an increase at 5168 because at 5172, they're dealing with a $6,500 deductible that has to be met before Anything is oh, so it's 3, Yes, ma'am. Yeah. <clears throat> the option three looks like you, under the uh, 5172 plans, mm -hmm. there's no family. Well, 5172, we're only required by the ACA to cover the employee. 
any family member or employee plus one that wanted to be part of that, um, I would sit down and explain to them that they would be paying just a little bit less per month to have an enormous deductible. Their deductible on the family plan would be $13,000. And, and I can see that's yeah. why I didn't know. Yeah. Is there a reason then we're, uh, we're, we're offering it then in option four? Well, well by, by mandate, we have to. You have to. <coughs> you got to do all yeah, of that. Yeah, we have to offer because that's how it's listed to the state. Okay. Uh, but any of our employees that wanted to do that, we would sit down and explain to them the uh, cost benefit to them of not choosing a family plan for that. And in option three, it looks like like the 3359 plan, I'm talking about just employees now, um, as well as the 5168, I'm sorry, as well as the 517, um, no, I'm sorry, as, as well as the other plans for family uh, and the employee is the same on option four, but the 51 and the 51, 69 is the same for family as option three, but the 5168 is just a few dollars more. Are we talking about employee plus one? No, if you look on option three, 5168 is 3730. Yep. Family is still 12507. If you go to option four, it's 4111. Family is still 2507. If you look on on plan 3359, the employee is the same as option four, and the family is the same as option four. What happens is, is that most of our employees are on 5168. Okay. We have over 800 on 5168 employee only. That is by far the largest so amount of employees. Kind of yes. Numbers and in order to keep those members from migrating down to 5172, I have to try to find a way to keep them on 5168. And again, what you're looking at there is the increase per pay period. If you look just to the right, you would see what the, the premium right. is. So the increase might look a little different, but that's because you have to look at what the premium was last year. Got it. And again, this is, this is a great deal of information that we're sharing with you. Um, Ms. Bryant was fortunate enough to see it the other day at the insurance committee meeting. Uh, no. Yes, and there were a lot of people that were uh, had some opinions on this. Uh, Ms. Serge is going to explain a little bit more. Are there any questions about the premiums? I've got a question. Um, and I know the response, I know the answer to the question I've been given, but I just want to make sure um, I like to have some backup, but you know, the deductibles are still relatively low. Deductibles have not been changed. And the response to why haven't we, in order maybe to save money um, overall with the plan, increase the deductible, the answer was, well, it's not a very significant savings. Correct. Not compared so, to the out-of-pocket, increasing well, the out-of-pocket. But, but what's the comparison, I guess? I mean, I, I mean, what kind of savings? Because really, if we talk about a rich plan, when you still have a $1,000 deductible, I mean, I'm just curious, you know, I don't know the answer, but I wonder how many other um, school boards, government agencies have $1,000 deductibles. You know, the trend has been to raise the deductible, but our trend is not going that route. So I guess I'd, I'd like to have an explanation of that. All right, Mr. Branham, come up and explain that to you. When we take a look at the out-of-pocket total expense from a plan design perspective, when we looked at changing in the out-of-pocket, we, we were getting about a 2% reduction in the overall claims that we need to fund for, just for our $1,000. And we're looking at, okay, if we raise the deductible, it's 0.3%, 0.5%. So we looked at raising the out-of-pocket again, additional, which we see at 2,000, and we get, got us a 4% re overall reduction in our total act claims that we need to fund for for the next full of 12 months. So that's, we were getting more uh, bang for the dollar, if I could use that, by lowering, or excuse me, by raising the, the out-of-pocket, which in turn lowers our our aggregate claims fund that we need to fund for. So once the deductible is met, basically it's what, 80, 20? It is 80, 20 on 3359 and then a 90, 10 on the uh, 5168 so so in other words if once the deductible is met uh, bill comes in for a hundred dollars 
the patient would pay ten dollars on fifty one sixty. What if we raised? Why are we at ninety ten? That's the first I've heard that. Is it? That's yeah, started. when we put it together, it's when we had, originally it was a hundred percent plan for several years. If you're, um, it was just deductible, and what happened was is is once the deductibles met, oh, what else can I get done? Right. You know, it's it's the plan is 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 total at a hundred percent. And I, I don't. I'm not. I, I should probably rephrase that. I don't need to be. You know, say that's the first time I've heard. It. That's the first time I'd ask, I'd ask the question. You know, and and I'm not on the health health insurance here at the school board, so I don't I don't have those. I don't take the health insurance here, so I don't know what those options are that are presented to employees. But um, what would the savings be if we went to an inventory? It's it's negligible. Um, it's it's how fast do you want to get to the out of pocket? So, if you raise the out of pocket, if the out of pocket's four thousand, what are you? It's 80, 20, or 90, 10, it's still four grand. Particularly when you're looking at it from an aggregate perspective. Okay. All right. That help? But I am glad you pointed out, and that is something we discussed at the Health Insurance Committee, that it's still a very rich plan. Not many plans keep the deductibles as low as ours are. And so we are able to protect that, and it is still a very rich plan compared to surrounding counties as well. So. Right. And, and you know what? What I think is that if we if you give up, uh, you know, benefits, then maybe there'd be a savings. You know, so it's kind of where's that balancing point between benefits and savings? Oh, you know, it's going to cost this much more if you keep these same benefits. You know, will it come down? And you know, you lose some on one end, but you pay less on the other end. So that's what I'm just trying to inquire about. And I wanted to share that we also went online and we went on to floridablue.com and we logged in and we played out several scenarios and we looked at how much, what kind of plan could we get, what would our premiums be, and this with these increases are still very comparable to what a person would do if they went online and tried to find something better. It's still comparable and it's still a very rich plan. Is there any interaction with the sheriff's department? No, they've, no, they've completed their separate. renewal process. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. yes. The only commonality is that we do share the wellness center. And I did want to mention we have union representation. We appreciate the union representation um, on our health insurance committee as well. Both of our unions are represented mm -hmm. and contribute. Sherry, just because I, I want to make sure I understood it correctly, um, what Mr. Dodd was asking, and I, and I think it just warrants, just to make sure that we're understanding it, um, if I recall, and I think I asked this during our briefing, raising the, the in-network deductible um, was not going to offset, is my understanding, a tremendous amount of savings That's correct. in the overall cost of the plan. <coughs> we could increase the out-of-pocket, and that actually had a greater effect in, in it than than the initial, what we, a lot of us think of as the, the typical deductible for the plan. <clears throat> That's exactly right. So we could go up and maybe double that and it still would have a less of an impact than unless, it, unless we raised right. the top end of it and that's the out of pocket. It's got a big impact on our employees for not much that gain on our plan. So we didn't want to do that to the employees when it wouldn't gain for our plan. That's what I, that was my understanding, but I, I, I think that because I'm, I'm, I'm with Mr. Dodd, it, I mean, just logically in the old, that's the lack of a better term in the old days, if we raised our deductible, you typically had a significant savings. If I had a five or $10,000 individual deductible, you usually could get a much more affordable plan. Has the Affordable Care Act, is that part of what all of this is affecting that, or is it just maybe just the, uh, the way everything's reworked? Because it does seem, it, I think it, you know, it's kind of, it, it seems different, it's so different than it was. Yeah. Um, the Affordable Care Act is definitely impacting, uh, particularly the revenue side, as uh, Mr. Baumer alluded to earlier. Uh, because of the mandates that were required uh, to meet affordability, with our premiums, our revenue can only be so much. Uh, burden on the on the em, em, employee. 
the, the problem is, is we still have, you know, 11 and a half, nearly $12 million in claims that we have to fund for. So what he's saying is we shift that to, even if the deductibles, we won't see that impact, right, in the, in the, in the claims until <coughs> if we had that shift. Problem is, is we may not have enough revenue to cover it if we had a huge shift to a higher deductible plan. So it's fair to say that the 3359 and the 5168 plans are having to subsidize yes. the 5172 yes. plans. Yeah. Yes. And as a, and that is significantly, significantly, significantly. Yes. and that is a requirement. And this I'm going back to is under Ms. Powers, and that's a requirement under federal law. Right. Yeah, we, we have to we have to have our plan. We put in uh, two years ago that had to meet affordability uh, and about the minimum value. So um, we were required to do that on top of the fees that Cherry was was speaking about earlier. And that's why, of course, if you look at the at all the increases, the lowest increase is obviously on one because it's mandated by federal based on the lowest right. uh, nine and a half percent. Nine and a half percent. Absolutely. And again, we have to adjust all the other numbers in order to make that work with their costs. So even if next year those claims went way up, we can't recapture that. We have to spread it among everyone else. Whether that's our self-insurance plan or whether we were, you were an individual buying a richer plan, so somewhere along the line, your insurance is gonna subsidize that plan. That's right. So if, if we continued on the path and we had a, another shift to the affordable care plan, through the year, we're still gonna have you know, 11 million, 11, you know, 11 five, somewhere around there in claims. That's what we're, where, where we're at. Problem is, is our revenue collection will go down because we had that, that large shift. So you're absolutely right. When we're talking about 18 renewal, <coughs> the other two plans will have to subsidize because we, again, cannot exceed the required, what we may need in real dollars because what we're mandated to, to where we can't exceed it. And if we fully insured, the same thing would take place. They're just going to, in essence, do the same thing with the group and spread whatever that is among somewhere in, the, in that whole group. So, in conjunction with what you're saying, another recommendation of the committee is that those that are on 5172 would not have access to the wellness center. And that would help mitigate that shift in folks that are shifting down to the 5172. And then there's probably people that are currently on the 5172 that are going to want the benefit of the wellness center, and they may shift up, up to the 5168. But I think someone said it here that that everyone else that's on, everyone that's on a, 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 excuse me, a 3359 or a 5168, all the folks that are paying those premiums are basically paying for the 5172s to be able to use the wellness center. So the recommendation is going to be that those on the 5172 not have the benefit of the wellness center. And that's something that we'd like to ask you to consider and that um, to include in the motion perhaps. What's the number? The number. the number of people in the 5172 and the 5173 plans? 258 folks are on, on that plan. And what's happening is they are... Sorry, they are out of how many total? 1750. We have 1,750 that have our health insurance. 258 of them are on the 5172. And the concern is those folks that are on the 5172 are having doctor's appointments, they're having lab work done, they're having prescriptions, they are having x-rays done at the expense of everybody else that is on the 3359 or 5168. We're the ones that are paying for those services and the 5172 with the premium so low, they're basically getting those services for free. And the feeling is that it's not fair to the other folks 
in our plan to be subsidizing basically the 5172 folks to be able to use the wellness center. So the recommendation is going to be that the 5172, anyone on that plan, is not able to experience the benefit of the wellness center. That's 15%, or it means, or I should say, it's 85% of those insured are paying to subsidize the 15%. Correct. Correct. Well, so this would the 5172 would still satisfy, satisfy a person's requirement to carry health insurance. Right. It would just be a plan that that does not have the benefit of a wellness center. Mm -hmm. And you said that we assumed previously that the 5172 people were, were in the the lowest paid in the system, and that's incorrect statement. It, it's just based on that by 19%, and it, it, anyone in the system that's should true. access it. So you could be the superintendent or anyone else, you could, you could access it. It's not the lowest paid. Right. One might think that it is one that we have to put into place for those lower paid employees, so perhaps they're the only ones that qualify for that plan, but that's not the case. Anyone can have that plan, and we do have a wide variety of folks who are on that plan. It's not just our folks that qualify, if you want to use that term. And what would happen, let's, let's say the uh, affordable care is voted out, otherwise known as Obamacare, it, it's voted out, and you no longer have it from the federal government. Then what happens to us? Where do we go? I don't it's believe about a year. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't think it would have any effect for our 2017 that we're planning on now. But, but it could have an effect on what we're talking about this time next year for 2018. But the only reason we have the 5172 plan is because of Obamacare. That's right. To meet the minimum requirements right. of the federal government. Correct. Okay. Exactly. And so we wouldn't even have this plan if it weren't for the Affordable Care Act. But in order to offer an affordable option, we are forced to not or have a plan that doesn't exceed nine and a half percent of our lowest paid full-time employee. A full-time employee could be thirty hours. Okay, so nine and a half percent of a thirty-hour employee—that's the 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 most we can charge for a plan. So, in my view. I know there's a number of people that are on that plan now, but as we continue to, to have to absorb these increased costs for health care, and it's a national phenomenon, right? I mean, it's, it's something not just we're dealing with, but everyone is. We have to make wise decisions, and, you know, what is the fairest way? Is it fair for all the other people to have to subsidize this plan even more? Is it fair that if other people look at it and say, hey, I'm going to do that, then it unbalances it even more? So, you know, I, I mean, I tend to agree with, with that, is that will, you know, maybe it'll meet the federal requirement, but yet it won't be as enticing to some people if they want to be able to go to the wellness center. And they might just move on up. And, and, and moving up would be a good thing for them if they wanted to go. But if, if, uh, if the Obamacare goes away, and uh, whenever the vote would be taken, if it goes away, and we pay how much, $60? An employee we pay for it, or what is the amount we pay? On the exchange? Yeah. The fees. I think it's the fees. Oh, what is our fee? 35 is the what? For, um, per this, employee. This is the third year. Well, there's two fees, but the Corey fee, which is the patient Center Outreach Research Institute fee, mm -hmm. it's only $2.17 per covered by. Um, the bigger fee, which is the transitional reinsurance fee, which is to fund Obamacare, mm -hmm. um, that is going to be twenty-seven dollars per couple of months. Well, if it went away, do we get it back? I'm serious. I I would love to hope so, but um, the stamp act is temporary. Maybe <laughs> you pay for your stamps. I don't think so. Well, yeah. So it's just down the tubes with no benefits, and that's what happens. And then we also discussed the fear that if we, this is a if 5172 <laughs> continues to have access to the wellness center, the thought of folks is, let's just go to 5172, I get free access to the wellness center. If that were to continue and we had even larger, even more people migrate to that, then the fear is that we're not going to have enough revenue and that next year at this time we might be looking at fully insured. Um, so that, that is a fear that unless we remove that benefit, that there's going to be a bigger migration and much less revenue 
It would be very afraid that it's, if I were making a choice and thinking, hey, this whole thing might go away. If I choose that one, I might not have it at all. So I better move up to the next one that I know I'll have. Well, that's a question, though, I had, too, is if, if I'm a 5172 right now, or 5173, and I decide that I, I don't like this plan now, You've not, you, it's, it's not a plan, and I'm not going to go to the 51, I'm not going to go to the, either of the other two options. Can I go to the open market? And is that called the exchange? Mm -hmm. So I can then go to the exchange and try and find a po an outside policy um, for that, and I can go shopping. Yes, you can. And, but if you go to the exchange, you will not qualify for the subsidies that they offer there because your employer officer offers an affordable that health care. Okay, that's what my question And is. you all looked, you all went online. And shopped to around see, ourselves to shopped see. Shopped around to see right. what is out that's there correct. and what we're offering here is still. Comparable. Okay. Yes. So we wouldn't be paying anything to those people who are going to shop. And that, that was kind of another reason why on 5168 we try to protect that plan, keep that individual plan as reasonable as we could so that those on 5172 that want to slide up can maybe afford to slide up. So we, we did try to protect the employee only on the 5168 as far as their premium increase. That's why we kind of shifted um, when we did the increases. I'd like to revisit one topic just briefly as far as this is a multi-year plan. This is um, going to help us build the reserve by a million. But just a reminder to be actually sound, the reserve must be at least two months in claims, which would be two million. And the new interpretation or the recent interpretation of being actuarially sound is also the um, run out, which would be 1.5 million. So what they're saying now, and it is a fairly new guideline, is that, you have, that we would have to have 3.5 million to be actuarially sound. So again, it's a multi-year plan. Each of these plans that we've presented to you is to um, build our reserve by a million. Let me just what show you. Say we would okay. have to have where would this money be? The 3.5 million. In our re insurance in reserve, in the, in the fund. In the fund. Yes. Sure. Yes. And if you don't mind, when we say it's a multi-year plan, it's a multi-year plan to work towards actuarial soundness, not that these these uh, premiums that we're sharing with you today would be in effect for multiple years. Exactly. I just want to make sure you clarify the record on that. Right. And this is the last year of our contract with Blue Cross and Blue Shield, correct? Yes. Now. What we all need to understand is we can still be self-insured and have a different insurance care. And that's going to be the challenge coming forward. It's, you know, that's our the, next big challenge. Yeah, yes. is, you know, maybe we can get rid of the Affordable Care Act, maybe not. But, mm -hmm. but we still have the option coming up next year to look at other carriers um, yes. to see if they can give us a better deal. And I know Blue Cross, I think customer service is very good. Again, I'm not covered by Blue Cross and I don't have the school board insurance, but I know there's a lot of other carriers out there too that offer a comparable service. So, you know, that's something that even if we switch to a different company, we can continue to be self insured. Mm -hmm. We are going to very carefully look, do an RFP, and look at all options. In our very carefully. Friday, we told them that we want to explore other insurance carriers out there. So, we're we can go across state lines now to. In the Minnesota firm or something? Yeah. Something right here would take. Yeah, that's well, the, that, how about getting the Minnesota firm? Well, why not? It's a nice state. <laughs> okay, just these last couple of. Oh. These are just a summary of the options since we can't show you all five slides at the same time. Fully insured would mean we would have no wellness center. Option one was to just straight increase our revenue and equally distribute it to everyone. And that's when we said, what else can we look at? How can we be creative here so that the employees aren't impacted that greatly? Option two, the out-of-pocket would be 2,000. Option three, completely remove the employee plus one. That's something that we prefer not to do. So option four allows us to keep the employee plus one, but does raise the employee plus one um, premium. <clears throat> and then this is just a snapshot of the options one, two, three, and four how much per pay period the increase would be in the various options. So once you feel this is absorbed and you've thought about it and we've answered your questions, I'd like to share with you pretty much three things we're seeking for approval. 
So do we have any other questions on the options? The only one, I, I, just because I know as we start getting into this, the next part you're going to ask, um, I know you shared that in the uh, 51, 72, and 3, there's about 258. Do you have the breakdowns of the other two? I'm just trying to, I'm, I know you said I think the 5168 has the most. I oh, just I didn't know this. roughly. It's on which plan? Yeah, just, I'm just trying to get some yes, rough, uh, percentages. Yes, I do have that. 3359, you've got, you have to add three numbers together. You have 244 employee only, mm -hmm. 44 employee plus one, and 36 families okay. for a total of... I can totally right, the 5168s, mm -hmm. employee only, that's the bulk of our folks, 814 people. And then employee plus one is 125, and the family is 223. So you can see by, okay. yeah, by <laughs> far, most people are on the 5168, and that's why we looked very carefully on how we could now, yeah, um, right. keep those increases that. as minimal okay. as we could for those people. No, and the 3359s can slide down. And the 5172s can slide up. So, and then the 5172 is the 258. You know, one point that we should make, though, and when you do your presentations, and I, I think that we talked a little bit about it, but you know, you hear that well, this is going to put another million dollars into the reserves to cover our claims, these costs, man. If you don't understand the amount of money that we spend, you may think, boy, this. Why are they doing that? But we got to remember that the board had to put $800,000 in last year in reserves. Mm -hmm. And this year, we're looking at 1.5, 1.6 .6 that we are going to have to put in to keep this fund sound. Mm -hmm. And what that means is our expenses, our claims have been more than what has been paid into the to the system, right? right. To yes. our insurance. Excellent. And that's why we gotta stop. We gotta make sure we can right. cover it. And the reserves aren't an option. We're required by statute to have reserves. It's not that we just want reserves there because it's nice. It's required to have. We have to. Board members, just to give you an idea, just by running Ms. Turnage's numbers, um, the 3359 plans, there's about 18% of our employees the 5172 plans, there's about 15%, uh, and um, the center plan, which they said the majority of people are, and that's 67% of our employees right there. I think that helped me just to... So then if you look at this slide, how the 5168 on the far right column... Well, it helps me kind we're of trying to keep why option compared to the right. Yes, yes. And then again, to protect the revenue and to protect the fact that we're self-insured, um, the thought to not have the wellness center benefit for the 5172 needs to be a strong consideration, we feel. And how about retired people? Where they fit in? Does, they, they have the option for any of these as well. They yes. Them. But they pay the full amount. They don't pay They don't get a board match. Yes, board no board match. The state sends a, a state, the state uh, a does stipend. send them some type of stipend. Okay, so we're asking for your approval for the renewal. And our recommendation would be option four. We're also asking that the folks that are on 5172 not have the benefit of the wellness center. And then a third thing for your consideration is a no-show policy to implement that. We've been talking about that probably about a year now and it's gone to the health insurance committee at least twice maybe three times and overwhelmingly unanimous yes yes and even they want to do even more than what we're suggesting we do um, because we know the problems that it creates with all of the no-shows that we have so the recommendation of the committee for the no-show policy to be implemented January 1st would be on the first no-show they would kind of get a buy there would be no fee they'd get a warning um, for their second no-show in a calendar year, it would be a $25 fee. And then for a third and subsequent no-show, it would be a $50 fee for not showing up. Is that for any and reason? For any no-show? 
it's just a no-show no matter what the reason because it's very easy just to make a call even if it's only an hour prior to. You make a call or you go online and you cancel your appointment, your appointment and that frees the slot up immediately for somebody that's trying to get in. And I was just thinking about so, Thomas's accident earlier. He called in. Yes. We're going to be reasonable. Exactly. We're going to listen. We will listen to what folks have to say. We'll be reasonable with that, obviously, an emergency. And they do get the one free pass, but we will definitely look at emergency situations. Um, but that is the recommendation that we implement that, and it would be a payroll deduction. And it is something I have had opportunity to share with um, both of our unions as well. And that's exactly the reason we do it, is so that when we do have somebody who finds themselves sick and has to get right in there, it's freeing up so that, so that we have that. And, and it, I do think there's already been an improvement been since improvement. some changes, you know, I think since you guys have tried to make some adjustments, but this will help even yeah. keep the cost down. Well, my opinion on the no-shows, and I'll, I'll express it, you, we express it in staff, um, you know, I think that to keep it simple, I think we have a free free time, first time, and then every time after that is $25, and just leave it at that, and not have to have somebody sit there accounting, well, what number is this, and all that, you know, if they don't, they miss their appointment, they don't cancel it, it's $25. You know, I know the committee's decided otherwise, and I respect that, um, but, you know, I thought I'd bring it to the board to see if, if you guys would consider that, if not, so be it. What did the committee recommend? We recommended to the committee nothing the first time and then 25, 25, 25 thereafter. And they felt that they wanted it to be the first time's the freebie and then 25 and then 50, 50, 50 for its subsequent. I think $50, I like will, $50 will get their attention. Oh, there. very well. But so you're, you're asking yourself, well, what's uh, why is the 51 a better appointment more costly than the 25? You know, you're questioning. I, I like your suggestion. Yeah, I actually, I, 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 my feeling would be is why don't we try it um, the way Mr. Uh, Dodd is suggesting for a year, and then we, if we find that we are getting a lot of repeat people, then we know what we need to do. So I, you know, I kind of like the simplicity of it myself. So I, I certainly can go along with that. <laughs> Mr. Dodd, it's your suggestion. Do you want to make your money? Um, I would be more than happy. <laughs> I don't want to take that from you. Okay. No, that's fine. I, I can do that. Okay. Are you ready, Madam Chair? Yeah. Okay. okay, I will make a motion that we approved the renewal of self-funded health insurance rates for the period of January 1, 2017 through December 31st, 2017 under option number four with no longer allowing the Wellness Center for the plan 5172 and having a a no-show policy that the first time someone fails to notify the wellness center of a cancel of a cancellation, it would be no charge, and then every subsequent time would be a twenty-five dollar charge payroll through payroll deduction. And I'm going to second that. Um, just following that, I think that it goes by being the most equitable to the most uh, to the most parties involved. It also went through the process of having, this is the expanded insurance committee, if I recall. So this isn't just a small snapshot. This was a much wider snapshot. We remember from each uh, job. So I, I, I respect that. And, um, and I think that Mr. Dodd's suggestion is a, is a good compromise. Um, and I think it'll be, you know, maybe a little better on that. So I'll second that. Moved by Mr. Dodd, seconded by uh, Mr. Kennedy. Mr. Cernich was just, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay. Mr. Cernich was trying to just explain to me that, that the plan 3359 and 5168 and 5169 will be a board match, yes. but there will be no increase on the 5172. Correct. The premium, it will be, it will be adjusted for this board match. This will be 
Well, these are all without any. Well, this is without any format. This is just. This is just the rates without any. What what uh, 5172 would do is, well, it, is their their uh, out of pocket each paycheck would increase 21. 91, regardless right. of whatever format is. That was my understanding. Right. This, yeah. this, yeah. this, 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 sure right. this is just These do not include yet a conversation of a more forward match. Right. Gotcha. Right. Yeah, regardless of whatever uh, ends up through the negotiating process, regardless of what the board match is, 5172 employee only under uh, option 4 will go 2191. Right. right. And so that staff understands as they're starting to learn about these numbers, um, this does not include you know, us being, Any you know, coming to the minutes. table, that's still a conversation you have to take that place. What, that's what my understanding of option four was, what Mr. Bishop just said. Right. Now, if you want me to, Mr. Bishop, is, do I need to include right. that, or is that understood that that is option four? That is, you did say option four. Yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Mr. Don, move that we accept option four as the recommendation from the board. Second. What was the second? Um, that the wellness center would not be um, under the 5172 and that there would be a uh, no-show policy for the first time with the um, no call and warning and this every other time after that would be a $25 um, payroll deductible um, fee. Any further comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries four zero. Thank you. And now we have, uh, <laughs> since this comment is fantastic, any comment, any uh, citizens wishes? Okay. Thank you. And let's see what we have next. Any other comments? Um, yes, Amy Wilson Finance. Good afternoon. Good evening. <laughs> I come to you today, I ask you to approve budget amendment number 10. This is amending um, the final budget for 15, 16 year. Just doing a little bit of cleanup. Those were handed out to you today. There's not a lot of changes. Just we have to clean it up before we submit the annual financial report. Point out any particular changes to us? Let's see. We. Decrease the fund balance by 27,000 in the general fund. That was mostly due to um, we just had to clean up the budget for match the actuals, where the budget for payroll wasn't enough to meet the actuals. And then um, the capital project fund, we decreased the fund balance by over a million dollars. Those were just projects that closed out that. We didn't use all the funds. There's really not a whole lot of changes on that. This is for the 15-16 year. This is the final June. This has nothing to do with the new year. So you need a motion to approve the budget amendment 10? I move to approve budget amendment 10. Moved by Mr. Uh, Mrs. Fry, seconded by Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kennedy to approve budget amendment 10. Any discussion? <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carries 4 0. Thank you. Okay. Um, now I come to you and ask you to approve the 2015 2016 annual financial report. You did receive copies on um, this weekend of the main part, which gives you the the ending expenditures and revenues of all the funds. And then today you received the 145, which is the government-wide statement. And um, in that statement, let's see, our net position decreased by about 4.6 million. The packet you got today, this is um, where we take all the revenues and expenses and we convert them into government-wide statement. and. To put it simply, if we closed for business on June 30th, 2016, and we liquidated all our assets and paid all our liabilities, we would be at $111,956,611.51. In the hole? 
No. No. I, I just wanted to make sure we clarified that. We're so used to the whole thing. So these, that's what the annual report does, is it takes our, our monthly financials that you get every month and we we look at everything we own and everything we owe and if we had to just shut down for business, that's pretty much the easiest way for me to explain it to you in non-accounting terms. Very scary. We just, you know. <laughs> so I asked you to approve this for the 15-16 uh, year. I move approval of the 2015-2016 annual financial report. It's been moved by Mr. Kennedy, seconded by Ms. Bryan, to approve the 2015-16 annual financial report. Any discussion? All in favor? <coughs> Aye. Opposed? Carries. 4-0. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. And do we have a uh, motion to approve the minutes? Move approval. Second. Moved by Ms. Bryan, seconded by Mr. Kennedy, to approve the minutes. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Carries. 4-0. Attorney Legal Matters. No, ma'am. Oh, Madam Chair, before we get into that, I, I did have a question about this item that was on our... Oh, yes. Is that something that we had to... That came to me and was asked to give to you. I gave it to you. Okay. But, but more importantly, I gave it to Ms. Swain and she will deal with it. Okay. <laughs> All right. I just I didn't know if we saw that. Thank you for Sorry. reminding us of that. Um, yeah, a couple of things. First of all, um, I want to thank um, Ms. Bryant for attending with me on Friday night uh, the rededication of Bramlett Stadium. That was a really exciting night. I know I saw Mr. Bramlett or Coach Bramlett um, Sunday at church and he was still beaming about it. And um, it was nice to be able to bring a smile to his face and, and some warmth to his heart and help him know that the community uh, is rallying around him still. And, and thank you to the sponsors, both the original sponsors of uh, Crystal Chevrolet as well as uh, Eagle Buick for um, doing the re rededication of that. Today we had the calendar committee and um, so I was there to represent the board. Uh, one thing I would just ask if maybe, Superintendent, we could bring to us, when the votes do come in, I know SAC only actually gets one vote per calendar, but if we could just still have what the calendar of choice was that the, uh, you know, just trying to make sure that we're, that we get the understanding of what the SAC's direction was on that, um, with that, what their actual vote was. I know we'll, you know, it'll be included with that, i just like to know what the SACs were thinking. Uh, the calendars, I believe, that were put together, as, as is probably no surprise, there's very little difference between the three. There are some differences, but I think almost all of them started and ended at the same time. Um, they honored the board's direction as well as the um, traditions of the county, we'll say. So I think that, uh, I think largely, the, I don't think there was a, a calendar that the board couldn't live with at the end of the day. So I think that was uh, that was good. Good job. No, it wasn't me. It, it, I, I just want to also, um, we teased uh, Mr. Simon earlier to say that, it, that, you know, it was a very difficult meeting. It was a very smooth meeting. And um, Ms. Crowell did an amazing job and really facilitated that meeting uh, just so professionally. And the, all of the, the representatives, they take that role very serious. And it, it was just, a, it was, I really was just there for the ride. So um, I just want to, Hurricane um, Hermine, um, I'm sorry, I think Hermione, because I, I'm a Harry Potter reader. So uh, um, I just want to say, you know, I'm very grateful that we did not have any substantial loss there. Marine Science Station, I just got to hold out. Uh, Mr. Olson did a phenomenal job getting out there. For those of us who may or may not know, that during that period of time, uh, Mr. Mullen 
uh, Mr. Calasante and Mr. Bishop, who I think Mr. Bishop's gone for the moment, but they went in like three different directions to make sure that our facilities were safe, and uh, we so appreciate that. I know that all of you gave great support. We had volunteers showing up that weekend at the Marine Science Station. I'm sure they were at other facilities to help out. Um, I love this school system, but I'm scared of snakes. <laughs> so I'm not sure the cotton mouths were, uh, were ones that I was ready to, to tangle with. So I was very grateful that I had a, uh, a swim meet this weekend that I had to be to, because um, I think otherwise Mr. Olson would have shamed me into being there. But I really appreciate it. I, I meant to ask earlier, um, we, for those who don't know, we actually have a boat somewhere. Does anybody know how the boat survived? And Because I was hopeful that we'd gotten that, so. Yeah, well, I know we had the Majesticus over at the uh, Coast Guard uh, dock over in the North Coast River. We'll work on Mr. Bradshaw to get that. Because uh, I know we've been trying to get rid of it, so I, I wasn't even sure yeah, if we yeah, had it that still. Yeah, the update on that is the contact of the Sheriff's Office. Uh, they're getting the, the right person involved to We don't have. I wasn't sure if we had it. We still have it. I, mean, I guess is what. Well, I'm, we don't own it. I mean, it's we have it in our possession, I guess, but we don't own it. The last record ownership is from 1984 by an attorney out of New York who was holding it in title for a friend of his who lived in Grenada. So it's it's so getting a title to it, getting a title to it has turned into. I think initially we were going to try to get a title to it so that we could actually you know, sell it or, or give it away or do something like that. The, the process of trying to get a title for that vote was turned into something Not else. There. So then you can move under the loss and the the property statute or the sheriff's office, as you know, because we don't, we don't want it for liability reasons. And so, you know, they, when people leave votes out in King Bay, they sink or they do whatever, they, you know, they declare a derelict vessel. I'm not quite sure. Did our sink? No. That's what I was, uh, that's what I'm I aware that, I don't know that. It would, that may be good. We, <laughs> yeah. we so, need to probably just get rid of that thing as quickly as we are can now. You would think it would be a lot easier. Than uh, Crystal River City, the city of Crystal River, I think, has learned it's a little more challenging than uh, city. Um, and I think that's really all I have. It's almost 5.30. We'll, we'll let's go ahead with the, uh, the public meeting, then we'll get back to you. So any discussions that work yes. for you? Yes. Okay. Okay. So then we'll adjust <laughs> over to the regular meeting and, uh, and uh, open the public hearing. Yes, I just <coughs> I'd like to say something before Ms. Wilson gets started. Um, and uh, Chris Lloyd mentioned this earlier, but um, we'll just put the elephant on the table about since our sales tax did not pass. Tonight, we're asking to adopt the budget, which includes our work plan. And then I talked and met with Mr. Bishop, Mr. Mullen, and our plan is in September to bring back our capital budget as part of the workshops. That's going to be today. Also, we'll start the state of the district. And we'll start that morning with the capital budget. We'll show you what's budget for this year and our years out. We've already taken some of the major projects out, such as uh, Full City and North Primary and North Middle School. And, um, so we'll bring those recommendations to you or suggestions and then we'll look at the entire project. And when will that be in the September meeting? Okay, and Mr. Bishop have all the staff here and we'll have questions and we have dialogue on what philosophy is and what we want to see. Okay. I come to you and I ask you to approve the 2016-17 millage rates, the final five-year work plan, and the final budget of the Citrus County School Board. Okay. The purpose of this meeting is to adopt the final millage rate, the five-year work plan, and the final budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2016-2017 fiscal year. Millage rates are 5.4250, which includes 0 .0340 prior period adjustment for operating purposes and 1.5000 for capital outlay purposes or a total of 6.9250 mills. 
The final budget for fiscal year 2016-2017 totals $215,466,533. Is there anyone here who wishes to address the board at, as to the village <coughs> the five year work plan or the budget proposed for the 2016-2017 fiscal year? Is there anyone who wishes to address? Is there a motion to include the supplemental millage rate of 0 0.7480 mills and the capital outlay millage rate of 1.500 mills in the resolution determining revenues and millages levy as required by law? I move to include the supplemental millage rate of 0 0.7480 mills and the capital outlay millage rate of 1.500 mills in the resolution determining revenues and millages levied as required by law. Second. Mr. Kennedy has moved and Mr. Dodd seconded the motion to include the supplemental millage rate of 0 0.7480 mills and the capital outlay millage rate of 1.500 mills in the resolution determining revenues and millages levied as required by law. Is there any discussion of the motion? <coughs> Resolution of the District School Board of Citrus County, Florida, determining the amount of revenues to be produced and the millage to be levied for the general fund for the District Local Capital Improvement Fund and for District Debt Service Funds for the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2016 and ending June 30, 2017. Whereas Section 1011.04 Florida Statute require that upon receipt of the certificate of the property appraiser giving the assessed valuation of the county and of each of the special tax school districts, the school board shall determine by resolution the amounts necessary to be raised for current operating purposes and for debt service funds and the millage to be levied for each such fund, including the voted millage and, whereas section 1011.71 Florida statutes provide for the amounts necessary to be raised for local capital improvement outlay and the millage to be levied and, whereas the certificate of the property appraiser has been received, therefore be it resolved by the district school board that the amounts necessary to be raised as shown by the officially adopted budget and the millage is necessary to be levied for each school fund of the district for the fiscal year are as follows. Number one, district school tax, non-voted levy. So certified taxable value, 9,074,000,000, Description of levy, required local effort, amount to be raised, $40,445,437, millage levy, 4.6430 mills. Prior period funding, adjustment millage, $296,176, millage levy, 0 0.0340 mills. Total required millage, $40,741,613, Millage levy, 4.6770 mills. Number two, district school tax, discretionary millage, non-voted levy. Certified taxable value, $9,074,017,367. Description of levy, discretionary operating. Amount to be raised, $6,515,871. Millage levy, 0 0.7480 mills. Number three, district school tax, additional millage, voted levy. That is left blank. Number four, district local capital improvement tax, non-voted levy. Certified taxable value, $9,074,017,367. Description of levy, local capital improvement, amount to be raised, $13,066,586. Millage levy, 1.500 mills. Discretionary capital improvement is left blank. Number five, district debt service tax voted levy, that is left blank. Number six, the total millage rate to be levied is less than the rolled back rate computed pursuant to section 200.065 paren one close paren Florida statute by 3.13%. Having heard the resolution and there's a motion on the floor, is there any further discussion? Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 It passes by a vote of 4-0.
Is there a motion to adopt the final proposed five-year work plan as the final adopted five-year work plan of the Citrus County School Board for the 2016-2017 fiscal year? I move to adopt the final proposed five-year work plan as the final adopted five-year work plan of the Citrus County School Board for the 2016-2017 fiscal year. Second. It's been moved by Mrs. Bryan, seconded by Mr. Kennedy to adopt the final proposed five-year work plan as the final adopted five-year work plan of the Citrus County School Board for the 2016-2017 fiscal year. Is there any discussion on the motion? All those in favor of the motion to adopt the final proposed five-year work plan as the final adopted five-year work plan of the Citrus County School Board for the 2016-2017 fiscal year say aye. 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 There are four ayes it's, and no nays, four zero, it passes. Is there a motion to adopt the final proposed budget as the final adopted budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2016-2017 fiscal year? I move to adopt the final proposed budget as the final adopted budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2016-2017 fiscal year. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Dodd, seconded by Mrs. Bryant to adopt the final proposed budget as a final adopted budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2016-2017 fiscal year. Is there any discussion of the motion? All those in favor of the motion to adopt the final budget as the final adopted budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2016-2017 school year say aye. 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 Passes 4-0. A resolution of the Citrus County School Board adopting the final budget for fiscal year 2016-2017. Whereas the School Board of Citrus County, Florida did, pursuant to chapters 200 and 1011 Florida statutes, approve final millage rates, final five-year work plan, and a final budget for fiscal year July 1, 2016 to June 30, 2017. And whereas the School Board of Citrus County set forth the appropriations of revenue estimates for the budget for fiscal year 2016-2017 and whereas at the public hearing and in full compliance with chapter 200 Florida statutes the school board of Citrus County adopted the final millage rates final five-year work plan and the final budget in the amount of two hundred and fifteen million four hundred sixty six thousand five hundred thirty three dollars for fiscal year 2016-2017 now therefore be it resolved that the attached budget of the School Board of Citrus County, including the millage rates as set forth therein, is hereby adopted by the School Board of Citrus County as the final budget for the categories indicated for the fiscal year July 1, 2016 to June 30, 2017. Is there a motion to approve the resolution adopting the final budget? I move to approve the resolution adopting the final budget of the Citrus County School Board. 2016 2017 fiscal year. It's been moved by Mrs. Bryan, second by Mr. Dodd, to approve the resolution adopting the final budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2016 2017 fiscal year. Is there any discussion on this motion? All those in favor of the motion to approve the resolution adopting the final budget of the Citrus County School Board for the 2016 2017 fiscal year say aye. Aye. Passes 4-0. We shall adjourn this portion of the meeting and go back to our regular meeting. Thank you very much. Oh, did I not do something? Yeah, you can't. You can't. What do you mean? Oh, we had something else? I'm sorry. Oh, it's still in the public hearing. Okay, excuse me. We're returning to the public hearing because I forgot it. Do the progression plan. Yeah, thank you. Can I just make a motion? Yes, please. I move to approve the 2016-2017 uh, student progression plan. Second. It's been uh, moved by Mr. Kennedy, second by Mrs. Bryant, to adopt the 2016-2017 student progression plan. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Carries 4-0. I guess y'all were saying, well, where is that plan? Thank you. Now we're out of, out of the uh, public portion of the meeting and back to our, our regular meeting. Now, and here, and and the only thing I wanted to send, because um, I know Mr. Dodd's going to go next, but I, I just wanted to follow up after this. Um, I know, um, Superintendent, you're going to bring us um, in the <laughs> workshop. I think 
about where we are. Um, you're going to bring us uh, some changes that we passed uh, some of those tonight, I believe, for the budget or uh, to modify that capital. Uh, first of all, I appreciate you doing that. Um, I know staff's beginning working on that. It's a direct result of meeting, obviously, with the vote that took place, um, sales tax. Uh, and I know there'll be more discussion on this. The one thing I would just say, and this is just this board member, but I know that this has been the, the basically the practice of this board. If it comes to not painting for a year, delaying putting in carpets, things of that nature, I am all going to be about doing that before we make corrections in the classroom or that are going to affect the classroom. Um, I know that's been typically how you approach things as well, superintendent, and as well as your staff, but that's really where I'm, my heart's going to be. Um, and I don't think that'll change a whole lot. And I appreciate because it sounds like you're already trying to make that that happen in that direction. I know you're going to get more details to us as the workshop takes place. But I just felt like I needed to lift that out. Thank you. <laughs> I'm <laughs> Thank you. Hurry, back. Still <laughs> well, in regards to the hurricane, it is sad for all those families on the west side of 19 that were affected so greatly by the floods. and. Uh, you know, we were fortunate, though, like Mr. Kennedy said, uh, not to have a lot of damage. Our schools, home Sass Elementary, fared very well, and Christopher Primary, and our biggest hit was the Marine Science Station. Um, but uh, my thoughts and prayers go out to those people on the west side of 19, because it has been uh, quite a mess over there. Um, you know, we have had great communication, though, during this process. I think uh, the director of the OC, uh, David DiCarlo, and the information shared through Superintendent Mr. Law and Mr. Bishop, I thought was very uh, well done, um, keeping us informed of what's going on. And um, so communication is, is the key. And uh, I think that what I saw took place was very impressive. Um, you know, there's another tropical um, system out there now, and they just sent another update on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it kind of brings me to my next topic, and that is the school calendar, because we were able to, or according to the information you shared with us, that uh, you were able to pretty much waive those two days of, of missed school. Um, we're still within the number of hours for instruction. And the principals, I guess, were in agreement that there was no large negative impact on the students for, for missing those two days of school. But I think going you know, forward from here, it would be very difficult if we were to have another system come in that we can do that again. And I just want to remind everyone that that school calendar, the dates that are identified as makeup days are the, the Thanksgiving week. And um, so I'm glad for our employees um, that have made plans during that week that uh, right now they don't have to change those plans. But I think it's also important that uh, teachers, employees, staff, people, members realize that those are the, the, the makeup days that we've built in. Actually, they're not. They're not on the calendar any longer as makeup days. Well, who let that happen? That was that was a that was a vote of a, a number of years ago. That's still been the implication, right. that but they be the, 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 but they they aren't on the calendars. That so we don't have that. that There's not a built-in on a, a notification. It's it's like it's yeah, it was written at one time, but the the argument has been is okay. So now what happens after November? If we have ice storms, if we have more storms, where would we make it up if that's the only place that we had them? Did you say ice storms? <laughs> Well, I'm thinking ice when we had freezing. We oh, had we've had we've lost days of school because we had freezing. Okay. And so yeah, right, no, I know. I apologize. I'm thinking of ice storms because we've had brainstorms that then turned to ice. Well, Mr. Kelly, over in Chris Rubin, there was a hailstorm, and honestly, the hail that big around. It was that, yeah. Yes. But so, so and the only reason, Mr. Well, Todd, I say that no, is because I, I didn't want no, um, people that to that think that that, that, was the, that was the that was the identified. Those are the days we would have. To that was that to where I think logically the right. question becomes though we could have a storm, you know, the first week of June, uh, uh, so it, right. December, and we could find ourselves having to have a conversation whether that be about holiday period or at the end of the school year. 
So I mean, I, and I so that's why, Mr. Scott. The no, only reason I, I say I that is I want I, that, you know that's a valid point. I, you know, that's uh, we had this discussion today in and in the calendar committee because for that very reason, because some people um, would, were concerned if we don't designate those days, right. that that's exactly it, and that became came the conversation of when so we change the calendar committee. They go back to having uh, no, they they days. didn't. They didn't, I mean, I for, think for the very good. reason that they said, well, what happens now after the fact? Mm -hmm. And because the superintendent's been able to get it waived, um, there seemed to be some concern about that. They understand it's always a case, but then they're saying it could be a case during Christmas break now. Well, there's always a few days before Christmas that we can not do next year's calendar, but this year's calendar, right. we can <laughs> add one more day there. But yes, going back to your original comment, Thanksgiving week is the Okay. But yet that's not written, that's kind of un unwritten, right. un unwritten rule. Or that's some districts have to just go add days to the end of the school year. Right, right. Well, then I do feel kind of for, uh, if, if that's not understood, if uh, a teacher were to plan to be, you know, buy airplane tickets mm -hmm. to, to be gone, I mean, uh, I guess then we can't. It's tougher for me to say, well, that's, that was yeah, that was intentional. Um, not just from teachers' parts, but because families were saying they wanted to be able to make plans. definitive plans. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. Well, hopefully we won't but have to go to, to that point, what? though, is if uh, Ms. Powell is a teacher and she takes that Monday off and we have to make that day up, she has to take personal time for that. Right. 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 Now, we did one year make up a day on Veterans Day. And we met with the Veterans Coalition and several veterans groups and met with them to tell them why we did that because that seemed to be the only day that we were able to make up that group. So and I think you that. structured it yeah. for all yeah. veteran yeah. type activities right. too. So okay. right. But I would be hard for I would be hard pressed to go with the Veterans Day as a make up day from my personal point. So uh, for what that's worth. Um, we would too unless we had three days to make up. So. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you can go so and the 9-11 the, uh, memorial was very well attended by our school, by several of the schools at the Valley Theater, and I know um, uh, they, uh, the Narleo National Association of Retired Law Enforcement Officers were very pleased. Uh, everyone um, seemed to uh, get a lot out of that memorial program with the artifacts in the Valley Theater and enjoyed going over to the Valley Theater and a lot of the groups tied in some other trips to the old courthouse. So I was glad that they had the opportunity to do that and that we uh, supported that. Uh, this was the 15th year anniversary of 9-11, uh, as I believe Ms. Bright mentioned at the opening of our meeting. And so um, I appreciate the district and the schools that were involved with that. Uh, SAC uh, committees, the advisory committees have all started, so I know we're all going to those meetings. and. Um, you know, the voters have spoken in regards to our absent sales tax, and so, uh, you know, the message is clear. We've got to tighten our belts a little bit, and uh, but we're going to make it work. Um, and there will be sacrifices, I do feel, especially uh, bad for Florida City Elementary School and Emerson Middle School. Um, and those, I'm not on the SAC committee for Emerson Middle School, I think you are, Ms. Powers, right? Yeah, and I'm, I'm on for Floral City Elementary School. I'm, and Emerson Primary School was the third one. Um, so, uh, but we're gonna, you know, we'll buckle down and uh, we're not gonna default on, on our bond uh, at Christopher High School, that's for sure. We know that going forward, but we're gonna have to make up. Um, uh, so, I thought I would just mention that because that was something that we all uh, felt strongly for, and, uh, but now we have to get on board with um, the decision of the public. Um, that's been made and so we'll live with that and um, we'll make it work also um, I would like to have um, as a, a workshop agenda uh, a topic on our uh, legal expenses um, I would like uh, to consider I know when we looked at the contract last year it was kind of uh, it was something that we had a little bit of discussion but uh, Mrs. Powers you had said that you know, that would be something that we could entertain any time during the year. Mm -hmm. We had talked about some issues with that, and I would just like to have some clarifications on things. Uh, I don't want to get into details right now, but I think it would be wise for us to look at um, the idea of 
um, of full expense options, because I think that's, I, I suspect that's where, Mr. Dodd, you're, you're also looking at it, wanting comparisons of costs, not just looking at our own attorney's uh, costs, but you're trying to look at legal expenses as a whole. And if that's the case, I think we need a direct staff as to what we're asking them to, to put together for us. Because um, I'm just saying, because as a board member right now, I don't know what we're asking for. So I guess that's really would be part of it. And if that's the case, then I think we need to review the fact of types of cases that we have and that we have to get legal services for. Um, that needs to be broken down so that we can review what those expenses are <coughs> and is there different ways we should be looking at that. So you're not just talking about our attorney, you're talking about any attorney, any legal expenses yes, that we I'm have. talking about the, our, our legal expenses as a whole and not just with Mr. Bradshaw and his contract, although that is a big part of it, but our, you know, what we're looking at in legal expenses. Um, I mean, just to have some clarifications on the contract itself, uh, too. I, I would like to have some, some clarifications. I mean, I guess, uh, Wes, when you come to the workshop, that's not in your retainer. Correct. Okay, so if we have you come to the workshop to talk about legal expenses, how much is, do we pay for that an hour? Yes. Uh, 200 or 250 I don't know, $200 an hour. So, you know, it's just that I think that I would like to look at the retainer, uh, what we uh, get for the retainer fee. Uh, and I would like to have, when I see the, the bills that come in over the phone calls, and you know, I'd, I'd like to have a clarification on when is a, a call, a billable call, and when it's not, um, you know, just some things like that. I'd like to have clarification on when we seek outside counsel, and there are some cases, and I, I've talked to Ms. Wilson, and you know, half, I mean, fortunately, in my view, it, we weren't, we're not spending as much uh, as I thought we were spending on outside counsel. Mr. Bradshaw is handling a lot of that. We're not, we don't spend that much on outside counsel or, or those people on the, some of the ESC cases and some of the things that, that you're dealing with that you know, we have no control over that we have to be able to look at and, and maybe budget for. But those are some things that I think it would be good just to have a, a, a workshop topic on. Are you including in that uh, full-time attorney or uh, attorney? Well, that Mr. would be Bradshaw's the direction. Position. I mean, that, that would be... Including it all? I mean, if we're having a workshop, I think we have to then just, I mean, because I, 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 I think we all know you're heading towards the fact that in November we're going to be renewing or we would go in a different direction with our attorney. I mean, I mean let's, we have to be honest about what, what's going on. So you're asking for a workshop to review that prior to that point. That's not a problem. I don't see that as a bad thing. Right. Um, but if that's the case, the board, I think we need to have that information so that we can say that. So if that's what, what some of the things you're looking for, then we need to be able to direct staff into what to put together. Because I don't think we're, well, we're just asking Mr. Bradshaw. Right. My, my goal is to, what, it, what are some ways that we can reduce our legal expenses? That's what my goal is. So if we have to renegotiate the contract, if we have to compare it to a full-time staff attorney, what can we do that could reduce our legal expenses? That would be can my I just question. Ask why? Why do you think that we have too high legal expense? What gives you that indication? Because well, the contract's the same; it's been for over two decades under two different attorneys. Mr. Right. Dodds brought up this before. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I, again, I, I didn't want to get into the details here. I mean, I can I can certainly say some things, but I, I would rather workshop it and have those things talked about and discussed at the workshop. I mean, I. You know, I'm giving an update. I'm just asking if the board, you know, I think it'd be wise. I think it'd be prudent for us to look at the, the big picture of our contract and to look at. And the reason I say that, Mr. Dodd, is because I have no problem with the workshop. I'm, I think that's a smart move. But you, you made the statement that you're trying to reduce the cost of it. That leads you to believe then it's too high by that statement. Uh, well, it is. It would lead me to believe that there could be savings. Uh, we could have a full-time person or a person that, if Mrs. Hemmel had other areas, that would coordinate with other positions, with risk management, with planning and development, uh, with those areas uh, as someone that could bolster and improve uh, those areas, that there could be a benefit to that. 
there could be a say not only a benefit to that but there could be a savings but more so I think it's important that we just get an update on our total cost and I think it's important that we clarify some things in the contract and so those are things that we can talk about before we get to November and Mrs. Powers you, you mentioned it in, in the, the meeting when we approved the contract this is something that we could come back to and visit at any time at, during the year so it's you know there is a concern say giving us guidelines where we don't uh, call up Mr. Bradshaw when we're on a topic that's that going to be charged that could be the case too I will be more than happy to discuss my contract in a workshop I'll also extend an invitation to each and every board member here if you would like to come to my office or meet me somewhere I'll be more than happy to discuss my contract with you individually for the workshop and to go over and answer any and all questions that you have so if you would like to you know come come to my office or meet me here at the district office to discuss it before the workshop. I'll be more than happy to. I'll be more than happy to answer any and all questions as well as discuss it, you know, in the workshop. I would like to, um, if you have specific questions in regard to my contract, I would appreciate a phone call or a meeting prior to so that I would know what issues that you have questions about so that I will be able to fully answer them, you know, at the workshop for you now. But I do extend that invitation at any time that the board would like to call me or come to my office and discuss any of those issues, there's always an open invitation for any board member to do so at any time. And that's part of the retainer fee? Yes. Right. right. I, I have I to don't. call Mr. Bradshaw as he knows a lot on the issues that we have. And I, I look just to double check, and I've never seen a, a charge with any of the, those issues that we've had. And that's, I believe, because you are our board attorney, under, and that's part of your, your contract has always been. So, okay. Okay, we are going to put down uh, September, the, the second meeting of September, the <coughs> meeting, um, or if that looks bad, we'll do October. It'll be one of the two. September or October. So we can get it done before November. And that, that will come up again. Okay. okay. And just as another friendly reminder, remember in November for the organizational meeting that we have to have it during Thanksgiving week. Right. Just so I know I had sent an email out to everybody, but just as a, yeah, I know that the, that was a while ago, but just as a friendly reminder, you know, we, we can have that meeting at any time on that Tuesday, and it, we don't have to have anything else but the organizational meeting and the uh, um, annual meeting for the leasing corporation. It can be a very, very short meeting, but we're by statute required to have it on that day because that's when we swear in the board members and superintendents. Let me ask y'all, as y'all remember, uh, on November the 8th, we have a board meeting, it's also election day. So, do y'all remember the past if, if we just went ahead as planned? Yeah, we did, we had election Went ahead as planned, okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure, since Mr. Dodd talked about family plans during Thanksgiving earlier, that mm -hmm. just a friendly reminder that although everybody else can leave, y'all have to come. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that hurt, Mr. Bradshaw. Okay, is that all, Mr. Dodd? Yes, it is. Okay, Ms. Bryant. I've been working on the insurance committee. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And we worked long and hard. I did go to Christopher Middle School's SAEC, and I want you to know that I had on my calendar Lake Canto Middle School's yesterday, and it, it completely went away. I didn't, I didn't open my little brain here where I've got it written down. There it is, written down. I, I forgot it. I apologize for Canto Middle. But I've been... Uh, That's extremely <laughs> Yeah, but but I, I've been kind of mopping up over there, sheds and porches and houses, and I've been busy mopping up, cleaning out. Your electricity was off for quite a while. Yeah, it was. And my um, uh, generator was on and off and on and off, but we didn't lose any of Nick's power, which is all I care about. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we had uh, talked before about bringing the sack. Uh, information to see if we want to do some changes and then any committee information. Uh, on the committees, I'm fine. I, I, if y'all have any changes you want to make, let me you know. Yeah. On the uh, SAC committees, I do have a request. I want to study something that's coming here about the uh, progression from uh, elementary, middle, and high. And in order to do that, I've got to have elementary, middle, and high. So I have um, Hernando Elementary. 
and I do have Crystal in her pocket. I want the feeder school, so I, I would ask you, uh, Mr. Kennedy, if I may have IMS this coming year as my. You are welcome to have it. I just, um, are you, which one do you want? Are you wanting to switch with me or? Because uh, that's the only middle school I have. Yeah. And I don't mind, I don't mind doing that at all. Why, well, uh, okay. So, yeah. I mean, if you want to just take it. Yes, I do. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. And then, uh, Doug, you have uh, Citrus High School. I'd like also to do Citrus High School, so then I have my progression of uh, Hernando, Denver's Middle School, and Citrus High School. Well, that, then, that means I won't have any middle or high schools. I can fix that for you. So, yeah. I, I would I like to get, River High School what if I took, open. what if I took with the Kuchu Tech College? I, I'd kind of like to have with the Kuchu Tech College. So I have that. So yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. And I get uh, Citrus High School and you get with the Kuchu. Does that help? You want to do it? Well, it, what about, I mean, there are what, four middle schools? Yeah. And, there, and there's four of us. I only have, I don't have a middle school now. I would, well, well, I, I would I like that. I like that. I don't have any. I don't have a middle school. I have a middle school. I, I, I like to have a middle school. Okay. Citrus. Oh, that's me. I'm sorry. I do have one. I had. I got reassigned. Okay. I apologize. Okay. But, but we're going to have a fifth we're gonna person. Have first. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. yeah. And that's a good idea. Maybe we should wait until our our fifth person. Well, we decided that the last minute was to go ahead because everyone's scheduling it now. We'll probably we each have times. to give up. One, yeah. um, when that person is in November, which will probably be fine because I think we all have an extra one right yes, now. Yes, we do. Because that's how I got the middle. That's how I got Citrus Springs middle. You know, one of the things, you know, that's my daughter school. is at Citrus High School as a senior yeah. this year. So really, I mean, the, you know, if I'm not going to have a middle school, I, I'd really like to have a secondary school. So I have Crystal River High School, so well, I have Crystal River High School. And I have a campus. Or I'll take Crystal River High and you can have the middle school and Citrus Springs Middle. I'm okay either way. My daughter's at Citrus Springs Middle, but my son's at Crystal River High, so I'd be fine. Well, uh, I didn't know we were going to get in, into this discussion today. I, I really would prefer to stay at Citrus High. My daughter's at I have two here. days' roof cards. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Uh, I'm a Red Sox fan, so I really like to get rid of Sorry. We never have a disagreement. It's probably the first yeah, time we've had a disagreement. Right. I, I'm trying to do something with the progression from the uh, theater schools, elementary, middle, and high, and uh, that's the one of the this group I'm most familiar with. Also, I'm starting way ahead. Being able to well, what if you took Emerson Middle this year, and then after my daughter graduates, you have Citrus High the following year? How does that I sound? Can't do the study this. I want to study this year. <laughs> 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 You're the you're the chairperson, so you can you can make. Well, I'm not, not going to impose. I'm just asking because yeah. I do want to do a study on it. And, um, well, like I said, I, I I have a I have. Well, maybe we can all today. You go one meeting, I go the other meeting. I'll still I'll just do double time study. How's that? That's up to you. No, no, because you want you want to go. So your daughter's there. I want to go to study. So let's just all make meetings. How many do we have? Four. I think there's four now. Four meetings. So let's do that. That's your decision. You can do what you like as chairperson. No, no, I don't do stuff like that. I do. Uh, so let's do that. Let, let's alternate meetings. Have you, uh, has, has there been a schedule put out by Citrus High? I went to the meeting meet? yesterday for Citrus High. Okay, so you've already mentioned one. You're the chair. Hey, that's the job of the chair. You no, I'm not jumping in. Well, it's make a decision because when I'm the chair, I'll make the decision. Yeah, he's going to put me over. And so, okay, so you're going to be an hour and That's right. right. No, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. So uh, then we'll do that. And you've been to one meeting, so uh, the next meeting I'll go to. You go to the next one after that, and I'll go to the next one. Or doesn't matter, just two okay. and two, whichever. Okay. All righty, we'll do that. Um, so therefore, I'll be on. Did anybody want one they can have? I mean, I'm okay with tricks. <laughs> <laughs> I just felt bad. <laughs> hey, you're so going to take my IMS. Yes. And that's fine. Yeah. I just um. And Are you going to go back to the meeting? Who's got one? I don't think so. We were very I, confused. Well, Miss, we're going to switch. Around. We'll do that with with the Coochie Tech then too, right? We'll switch. Oh, that's a good oh, idea. Oh, fine. Yeah, with Coochie Tech, just had a meeting uh, that I, in fact, I was out of state and couldn't go to, so I, I didn't go to that. Okay, one. that sounds okay. So Linda help us with this because we'll forget and end up throwing meetings. I'll forget to go to the meeting. <laughs>
Well, you all like to skip this year. And I, I believe the um, that Mr. Hebert is also checking to make sure we don't have overlaps so that he talks to meetings on overlaps. So with this new adjustment, I know in mine I've got one, but they'll. Uh, I think I've, I think they'll have, they'll have one meeting and there's no overlaps. So because sometimes there's meetings on the same days. Yeah. You can't do two places at once. I try. It hurts. <laughs> 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 yeah, they go. I was speeding last year from one meeting to the other, so it's not good. You need to have a little time. Okay, now, does anyone else know what group they're on? What mm -hmm. side they're on? Going. Everyone knows? Okay. And then when the new board member comes on, uh, you're going to make the assignment for, for that person. I think we'll each give them one. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just write up the chair with this. We'll each give them one. Or I'll excuse me. <laughs> According to succession. <laughs> Actually, Doug just had he take over. He's not going to have any more of this. <laughs> I just keep thinking the chairs move this way. Sorry. Sometimes they do. See, I went back to the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let me go just to a couple, a couple of other issues. I went to a health advisory committee meeting and some incredibly good information. And they were also presenting the fact that. Um, they just don't deal with kids, they deal with adults too. They have uh, smoking cessation uh, uh, sessions like, and, they, and people, people might still be smoking, they have something to deal with that. So there are a whole lot of things that the um, health people have to offer adults and kids. Fascinating information. Uh, last thing, th this is something like way out, it's about springs actual springs in the state of Florida, and I was uh, oh. up, up in, uh, up, up, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, <laughs> when, I, when I left, I always get all the papers collected, and I came back, and I started reading some of the information, and they were talking about springs, as I had been reading prior to leaving, about springs in North Florida, and about just, you know, what a situation that we're in, in the state of Florida, and I was thinking of our studies over on the coast, about the water, uh, saltwater intrusion, they mentioned the Homosassa River as one other place. So, uh, and that's the reason I said, we got Fiji here, I didn't bring one from the, that was bottled in Florida because I thought, well, that's not good. Uh, so I, th I think all of us need to maybe pay a little attention to, maybe encourage our students to study a little bit more in terms of the water situation in Florida because it's really becoming acute. We've all, all of us have known that you know we have the aquifer very close to the top in Florida, and that there's there uh, in fact up in North Florida you have trucks and stuff in the aquifer, but it, it's getting worse as we get more and more people coming to Florida. The situation diminishes, decreases uh, in the water uh, purity, and, and uh, increases in the pollution. So uh, we have Estuaries Day coming up at the Marine Science Station, which will go through with some of that very slow. So um, when is when is when that? Is that? Do you know? Had to ask. I'll find okay. it. Okay. <clears throat> I was supposed to write it down, but I haven't. <laughs> yes. I'll. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Where do you find it? Just send I'll it. send it uh, out, but I think. Okay. Thank you. Well, thanks very much. And in the front, we'll present it. Mm -hmm. so. It's in it. It's a branch off. No, ma'am. Okay. If there's nothing else from anyone, I'm just going to I'm about to find it. Thank you. How are you, Dr. Kevin? Good. That no. game sounded very familiar. What's that? Oh, that game? I was actually playing. playing uh,